To return to the house metaphor we've introduced in previous lectures, we're now approaching the final stage of our building project. The Bible and Christian apologetic traditions have served as our foundation. By examining the contemporary methods debate and then reframing apologetics around the gospel itself, we've erected the walls and the exterior of our apologetic house. In the remaining les lessons, we'll enter the final section of the series of lectures in which we construct the most visible aspect of apologetics at the cross. That is, the, the practical outworking and application of all we've discussed so far. You might say that this is what makes the curb appeal, the trim, and the furnishings. Yet, before providing some specific strategies for responding to cultural trends of late modernisms and to plausibility structures those trends have created, we need to first examine three general historical shifts, pre-modernism, modernism, and late modernism, and then discuss two salient aspects of late modernism. These are aspects that the philosopher Charles Taylor calls the imminent frame and what we've labeled the age of the spinmeister. Before I proceed to outline the three basic periods of Western culture, I need to note that these three basic periods are not sketched in stone. Historical movements are never so neat that they can be encapsulated with just simple characteristics. Nor for that matter are people who live during these periods all the same. These admittedly simplified divisions are intended to help you get your feet on the ground as you embark on deeper studies of history and culture. Pre-modernism is the first of the three basic periods in Western culture. In the pre-modern era, people believed in the supernatural. People generally assumed that God or the gods had created the world and that there was a spiritual realm beyond nature. In fact, they saw nature as pointing beyond itself to a transcendent reality. Traditional and religious institutions were viewed as authorities that should be listened to and obeyed, and they provided the ultimate frameworks through which people lived their lives. Moreover, such in institutions were central in forming closely knit communities. People did not see themselves simply as individuals but they saw themselves as members of a corporate whole. Thus, the faith and obedience of individuals were viewed in light of how they impacted the whole community. In the middle of the second millennium, significant thinkers began to question the ability of traditional authorities, the church, tradition, scripture, and even community. However, eventually, people began to challenge some of the, the beliefs of modernism. People began to realize there, there, there is no neutral, universal reason. There, there's no way to approach evidence and reason free of all biases. The most widely used term for the period of time, extending from the middle of the 20th century to the present, postmodernism, tends to give the impression that the period we are now living in is the very opposite of modernism. However, this is not really the case. For some of the key principles of the Enlightenment are still at work. It is for this reason that we think it's best to refer to this period as latent modernism rather than postmodernism. While history and culture are complex and resist singular explanations, it's safe to say that the present late modern culture has been profoundly shaped by the modern turn to the self. Like moderns, late moderns still set the autonomy of the individual and personal freedom over against the claims of tradition, religion, family, and community. The self still rules, but with the shift to late modernism, people began to see the alleged neutrality of early modernism as a myth and the notion that humans could control nature through precise reasoning and science as an illusion. The response to the hubris of modernity's quest to obtain certainty through human reason can certainly be viewed as a relief to Christians. The truth is that every human views things from a particular and non-universal perspective. And scripture is clear that humans are finite and sinful and therefore have a limited perspective. And yet, even though Christians can draw upon some important lessons from this development in thought, most late moderns did not derive their rejection of modernism from Scripture, and as we have seen, some have taken their critique too far.
Ultimately, the gospel should never be tamed by the prevailing assumptions of any period. In this lecture, we're going to examine two salient features of late modernism. First is what Charles Taylor refers to as the imminent frame. He's just this term to refer to how, in the current cultural context, people view everything in, term, everything in terms of a natural rather than supernatural order. The modern social imagination, which is deeply embedded in much of our culture, works from the assumption that that while people can find significance or meaning in life, there is no higher divinely given purpose that has been assigned to them. A helpful way of understanding the eminent frame is to picture in your mind a two-story house. Our pre-modern ancestors lived in a two-story world. Humans lived on the first level, but believed in the existence of a second floor, a higher realm. Theirs was an enchanted world where higher beings were assumed to be active and relevant in, in the affairs of everyday life. There was something greater after this life, a higher realm of existence that gave meaning and purpose to life. In contrast to this, today we live in a disenchanted one-story world that denies the existence of the divine or supernatural. In much of the West, the commonly shared habits, goals, and symbols of day-to-day -day life and the meaning commonly ascribed to it point us to the physical world around us and normally no further. Thus, we inherit these habits and goals and symbols from our culture and we consciously and subconsciously absorb the drive to live for, long for, and learn of things on the first level, not the second level. The second description of late modernism that we'll cover in this lecture is what we've called the age of the spinmeister. Many people, though they might not be able to fully articulate it, have been made skeptical and distrustful of any persuasive efforts because of what has been termed the PR effect. The modern world has produced a professional industry of spinning news, press releases, commercials, and marketing campaigns which, on a regular basis, seek to change our perceptions. Those in the marketing industry are more than willing to spin the facts in order to convince you to buy their product, whether it be an idea, a worldview, a politician, or simply a pair of shoes. Hugh Hecklow offers a list of strategies that top communication representatives use. Stay on a simple message rather than deal with complex realities. Appeal to emotions rather than taking the time to reason with an audience. Frame issues to steer people toward the desired conclusion rather than informing them about the sus substance of any given issue. Project self-assurance rather than admitting uncertainty or ignorance. Counterattack or change the subject rather than trying to answer tough questions. Avoid self-criticism rather than admitting your faults and trying to correct them. Claim to have the whole answer rather than admitting there is any expertise independent of which you don't, which doesn't actually support your claim. Above all, talk to win rather than to get at the truth of things. A culture that is perpetually spinning to win over people's trust ironically breeds distrust. And it can be hard for the unbeliever when approached by a Christian not to feel as if he is the target of a Christian sales job. Some apologetic and evangelistic methods, especially when rigidly applied, give the non-believer a sneaking suspicion that even Christians are spinning, using the same modern sales techniques as everyone else. Though we trust that's not normally intentional, it is nonetheless how Christians are often perceived. And truth be told, how Christians often approach persuasion. Christians, both in dealing with their own doubts and in trying to persuade skeptical friends, can end up just offering their own spin. Notice, for example, how eerily similar the list that I just gave you sounds to the way many Christians approach apologetics. 
project self-assurance, and never admit uncertainty. Keep things as simple as possible and avoid nuance. Never admit weaknesses and always, always talk to win. With these two features of contemporary culture that I just listed, the eminent frame and the age of the spinmeister, we would suggest that we as Christians need to do some deeper thinking about our posture towards other perspectives. Think about this with two options. Option one is what we call spin. Some believers and non-believers hold their view of the world as what James Smith refers to as spin, which is an overconfident picture within which we can't imagine it being otherwise. And because those who adopt a spin see their perspective as simply obvious and don't understand how anyone could view things any other way, they tend to smugly dismiss those who disagree. Holding and presenting your view of the world as a spin is a recipe for mutual caricature and unsympathetic listening. Spin makes entering into sustained mutual dialogue with those who hold different views difficult, if not altogether impossible. This is because it it inevitably leads to what Charles Taylor refers to as conversation stoppers. In other words, these sound something like this. I have a three-line argument which shows that your position is absurd or impossible or totally immoral. Option two can be seen as, as what is called a take. The second option is for us to recognize that our view of the world is a take. And and while embracing a picture of reality in a certain way of inhabiting the world, to acknowledge both the contestability of our view on things and the pull and tug and cross pressures of alternative views. Believers and unbelievers who inhabit the imminent frame in this way are, are willing to admit possible weaknesses of their position, especially given the assumptions and plausibility structures of other takes. When someone recognizes that there are different frameworks which lead to different interpretations of both evidence and experience, the conversations they have with those who hold other views than their own tend to be much more open and fruitful. In this culture of spinning that we live in, there is an opportunity for Christians to look radically different from most by not offering a spin as they seek to lead others to the gospel. Certainly it is true that a that as apologists we're trying to convince others, and there is a place here for technique and persuasive efforts. However, as we've stressed throughout this lecture series, our persuasion must first and foremost be informed by the cross. Compared to Heckelow's abbreviated list that I just mentioned a few minutes ago, a cross-shaped approach to persuasion looks differently. We might call this the apologetic PR. It would go something like this. Keep coming back to the cross, but be willing to deal with complex realities and complex questions. Never simply appeal to emotions in order to manipulate. Rather, take time to understand the other person and deal with their questions in a way that treats them as a holistic being. Admit that you are looking at the world as a Christian, but communicate with them that you're willing to try to understand where they're coming from. Be humble and admit areas of personal weaknesses, uncertainty, or ignorance, while affirming that you have great confidence in your faith in Jesus for a variety of reasons. Be willing to discuss tough questions rather than quickly counterattacking or changing the subject. Be self-critical rather than never admitting weaknesses. Admit limits in your knowledge rather than acting as if you are an expert on every subject. Above all, speak with grace and truth for the good of the other person rather than simply seeking to win. This quick list provides a framework for our posture and our tone and our communication, and therefore is a pretty good starting point. But we also need to be more specific, and we need to discuss practical strategies for engaging others within late modernism. How might we engage with different cultural plausibility structures when they are alien to Christianity? This is the question I'll answer in the following lecture. In the last lecture, I ended with a question. How might we engage with different 
cultural plausibility structures when they are alien to Christianity. The approach we suggest is called Inside Out. Inside Out is a framework that is to be internalized and applied in a wide array of apologetic situations. The goal of starting with the other person's assumptions is to create space in order that they might consider some of the problems with their own outlook and be willing to consider the plausibility of Christianity. The inside out model insists that the gospel and a robust Christian theology be at the center of apologetic interactions and woven into dialogue throughout. Moreover, the inside out model suggests that, apolo- that the apologist, instead of attempting to get an unbeliever to build along with him based on some kind of preconceived apologetic building plan or an assumed framework for rationality, which that person may or may not share, instead, instead inside out focuses on points where Christianity overlaps with the view of, other, of the other person. These two aspects of the inside out model allow a Christian's apologetic approach to be both gospel-centered and other-centered. While holding to a robust view of the gospel, the apologist places emphasis on understanding the other person's view in order to see where their framework has internal inconsistencies and lacks the ability to cohere with human experience and history. The model is not intended to become a rigid system or method that is, that is to be followed slavishly. Instead, what we are providing is some mental scaffolding, if you will, for you to keep in mind as you engage unbelievers. There are two important diagnostic questions for engaging inside a non-Christian's take. So we're starting off on the inside, and here are two diagnostic questions. First, what can we affirm and what do we need to challenge? While acknowledging that your own view is a take can be difficult and can raise important questions, working with others to help them realize that they too are offering a take comes with its own challenges. The most beneficial approach is to affirm the aspects of the other person's position that you find admirable, but then to also identify points that seem to be impractical or inconsistent or to offer an unsatisfying explanation of things. To offer some more contemporary examples, in the Western world today, Christians can affirm things like the fight for human rights, the emphasis on appreciating diversity, or the virtue of serving the oppressed and marginalized in society. Those are all things that we can affirm. However, as we engage others, we should identify underlying assumptions that we need to challenge. For example, in confronting a Western culture, Christians often will need to challenge the culture's sense of moral autonomy, which says, how dare anyone, even God, tell me what to do? We will need to challenge the culture's denial of divine accountability, which says a loving creator wouldn't judge his creatures. And to offer just one more example, we will also need to challenge what Robert Bella has termed expressive individualism, which is this pervasive notion that I am to look within myself to define my true identity. The second diagnostic question working from the inside of their framework is the question, where does it lead? One way to help others see their blind spots is to trace out where their assumptions and beliefs would ultimately lead if they were applied consistently. Fallen cultures often contain assumptions that make Christianity seem implausible Yet those who hold these assumptions usually haven't worked them out in their head. Those assumptions are, after all, the very air they breathe. Because of this, by asking questions and discussing the implications of certain views, an apologist can expose those views as overly simplistic and unsatisfying. For instance, Charles Taylor has argued in his book, Sources of Self, that while people in our culture normally just assume things like, universal human dignity and human rights, they aren't quite sure why they believe so strongly in such truths. This belief often collides with other naturalistic assumptions about the world. Sympathetically listening to others and admitting when they have a point, but then pushing their basic assumptions to their logical conclusions will help them see the problems and challenges with their own view. Creating uncertainty 
in the other person's view. You might even say creating doubt in their own view will create the space needed to discuss other options, namely Christianity. The point of starting from the inside of an unbeliever's perspective is to challenge the assumptions they hold in such a way that you don't cut off the conversation by wrongly assuming that you share the same framework for reasoning. The goal is to enter into their framework in order to open up this space and lay the groundwork for being able to take them to Christianity, which previously seemed strange to them because it was outside of their perspective. Next, as we move outside of their perspective to Christianity, there are two important diagnostic questions. First, where do competing narratives have to borrow from the Christian story? Having listened carefully in order to take inventory of what can be affirmed and what needs to be challenged in an unbeliever's view, we will be in a position to show them how the Christian story includes vital resources, which, though they may be present in the unbeliever's framework, are actually borrowed from Christianity, since their framework doesn't have anything to ground such resources. To use our previous example, human rights and universal benevolence better sits within a Christian framework than a purely naturalistic framework. Leaning in on this pressure point offers a way to articulate and defend the gospel. Second, how does Christianity better address our experiences, observations, and history? Or I could put this slightly different. How does Christianity better capture the rich texture of this life and history? Being able to answer this question in conversations and connect human and cultural aspirations to Christianity is directly related to having an understanding of the gospel. After creating space by working inside of an unbeliever's plausibility structures or take on things, you'll be in a better position to persuade them of the relevancy and truth of the Christian take. At this point, a good question to ask are, what are some of the ways that we can connect the human and cultural aspirations of late modernism to the gospel? In what way does the Christian story offer the greatest explanatory power for human experience? To answer these questions, we're going to turn to our next lecture as we cover some of the key features of late modernism and examine how Christianity offers a more livable, coherent, deeper, and ultimately compelling framework for life.